Mike Sheridan here. In today's video, I'm going to deliver my part two debunking of the claim that vegan or vegetarian diets are healthier than those containing meat. With this edition focusing predominantly on the research or so-called evidence that meat eating increases your risk of heart disease and cancer. Not only highlighting the fraud it's based on and the flaws it continues with, but helping you understand why the plant-based con lives on. Before jumping into today's content, I encourage you to check out part one of this mini-series, which goes over when we started eating meat, why we as human beings continue to eat meat, what you're actually sacrificing when you decide not to eat it, and how you're damaging your health as a result. Both because of the essential nutrients you're not acquiring, and because of the damage done as a result of your attempt to acquire those nutrients elsewhere. In my opinion, this should always be the first discussion when deciding whether or not to eat meat. And after watching that video, I'm convinced you'll agree it should also be the last, as any downstream discussions are simply distractions from the reality of what made us human and what our bodies require as humans to function optimally and prevent disease and degeneration. But for the last 50 plus years, we've witnessed doctors and scientists present and even promote new research findings on vegan or vegetarian diets like they somehow discredit a million plus years of eating animals. Are they that committed to the plant-based cause that they're willing to look absolutely foolish in their pursuits? Or does it just come down to who's funding their research and who's signing their paycheck? Because let's be frank, anyone claiming their observational correlations demonstrate causation is a bad scientist. And anyone that reads and studies nutrition research understands the inherent flaws that come with it. The reality is, even if the research was airtight with perfect data, no biases, full compliance, statistically significant causation, you still have to be confident enough to say that this proves human beings shouldn't have been eating animals for the last million years. Or in the case of what we're discussing today, that this meat eating has been causing cancer and heart disease since we became human which I think you and I both understand is not even close to the truth. Or as I explained in part one, our primal ancestors ate far more animal products than most of us do now. And even if we look at a hundred years ago, we ate far more meat, notably the red kind, and animal fat, notably the saturated kind, while heart disease and cancer rates were far lower. But let's stay on topic here and take a look at this vegan and vegetarian evidence that says they are healthier than meat eaters and the dietary practice of eating meat causes disease. Which starts with the introduction to the less fat, more fiber, lower cholesterol narrative, or as I like to call it, the trifecta of BS. Continues with Colin Campbell and the China study, also known as the Vegan Bible, and carries on with bias and flaw-filled observational studies from grain, soy, sugar, and pharma-funded organizations and governments that don't actually prove anything. And please note, I do understand that there's far more out there to analyze than this list, but as I'll explain, it doesn't really matter if there's 100 or 10,000 papers because they all have the same issues. And yes, I also understand that other nutritional studies have a lot of the same problems, but like I alluded to already, people aren't trying to use these other studies or make life-changing recommendations with them to challenge the dietary habits of a million plus years of omnivorous eating, where animal products accounted for over 50% of the diet in most cases and 0% of these primitive ancestors that we all descended from relied on a diet completely devoid of animal products. So hopefully you have watched part one 
And if you haven't, you at least recognize the scrutiny that should be placed on anything suggesting that we should upend the animal eating habits that made us human. Whether we're talking about eating the meat or whether we're talking about eating the saturated fat and cholesterol that comes with it, which we'll touch on first. Just like meat, the first question you should ask yourself is, if we've eaten saturated fat and cholesterol for so long, why is it all of a sudden an issue now? And just like meat, the answer is, it's not an issue. Your research is being presented in a way to make it look like an issue. Whether that's because the study design has bias, the data collection is inaccurate or has bias, the data presentation and conclusions are misleading, or the scientist flat out fudge the numbers which sadly was the case with Ansel Keys and saturated fat, Dennis Burkett and fiber, and Colin Campbell and the connection he attempted to make between meat and cancer. It's since been shown, and I will explain, that all these guys were fraudsters. Though even if they weren't, their findings should have been held up against the fact that we've always eaten the foods their research is demonizing. And perhaps if we did, they would have never changed the way people eat and they think they should eat or directed us down a 50 plus year path of fat, frustration and preventable disease. Now, I don't want to elaborate too much on Ansel Keys because he's not exactly saying be a vegan or vegetarian, but he's worth mentioning because his seven country study formed the basis or idea of the low fat guidelines and unnecessary fear of fat which naturally extends to saturated animal products and thus adds firepower to the plant-based propaganda studies and advocates who cite this like it's an irrefutable fact. Simply put, in 1953, Ansel Keys provided research results that compared dietary fat intake with heart disease in seven countries and along with producing the chart on your screen showing a clear correlation, he concluded that Americans ate the most fat and had the highest rate of death from heart disease, while Japanese ate the least fat and had the lowest rate of death from heart disease. Now the first thing to understand here is that these are observational findings that are supposed to form a hypothesis or question for future research on causation, since just because two things occur together or in unison, doesn't mean one cause the other. It simply means they are correlated or occur together. For instance, here are some funny things that occur together, but clearly one doesn't cause the other. Unless you think pool drownings are caused by Nicolas Cage films and divorces in Maine are caused by margarine consumption. And yes, this does occur in other research, but like I said before, the vegans and vegetarians are attempting to present this type of information as evidence. The reality is, it's not evidence. It's a hypothesis. No matter how many of these studies you want to try and fund, cite, layer on top of each other, or group together in a review. It's simply a bunch of repeated observations and hypothesis with no causation established. But back to Keyes, the real kicker for him was that he actually collected data on 22 countries. And when all countries were properly analyzed, it was clear that saturated fat and heart disease were not even correlated. For instance, Finland and Mexico ate similar amounts of fat, yet the death rate from heart disease was 24 times higher in Finland. Likewise, similar country comparison research has been done since Key's falsified study, and correlation once again couldn't be established, meaning you can't even form a hypothesis that saturated fat and heart disease occur together. They're completely unrelated. For instance, in 1998, researchers in the journal Nutrition looked at the average intake of saturated fats in 41 European countries and produced the following images. The image on the left of your screen is showing cardiovascular deaths, countries with the most in dark red, while the image on the right of your screen is showing fat intake, 
countries with the highest intakes in dark red. Obviously, this disproves Ansel's findings, but more importantly, it appears to suggest the opposite, that countries with the highest saturated fat intake, like Switzerland, have some of the lowest death rates from cardiovascular disease, while countries with the lowest saturated fat intake, like Georgia, have some of the highest. But all that said, let's not elaborate too much on the big fat lie that turned us all away from meat and gave vegetarians the false hope that they had a scientific leg to stand on. If you're still not convinced it's a farce, I encourage you to check out my introductory book, Eat Meat and Stop Jogging, which covers more of the flawed evidence against fat, and I now offer for free at eatmeatandstopjogging.com. Just check out the description below this video for the link. Moving on to fiber, it's a very similar story here, and the reason I mention it, even though it seems to have nothing to do with meat, is because it helps form the other half of the dietary argument for more high fiber plant matter and less low fiber meat matter. Or as the dietary guidelines tell us, we need to eat less meat and adopt a plant-based diet because it's low in fat and high in fiber. Grains and legumes have less fat and more fiber. Animal products have more fat and less fiber. Fiber lowers disease risk. Fat increases disease risk. So eat more vegetarian foods and eat less meat products. It's simple, right? The problem is, just like fat, the research on fiber was based on a hypothesis and a hefty dose of fraud. This time by doctors Dennis Burkett and Hugh Trowell, who were studying the diets of secluded tribes in Africa to determine why they weren't experiencing the same diseases seen in the Western world. And without going into too much detail, they ultimately concluded, based on their observations, that these Africans had lower rates of colon cancer and heart disease because of a higher fiber intake. Even though it was later discovered that Burkitt conveniently withheld data from tribes like the Maasai that were consuming low amounts of fiber and relying heavily on saturated animal fat and protein while experiencing the same lower rates of disease. Sadly, it was already too late as Burkitt's findings in the 60s paired perfectly with Key's findings in the 50s to form the new dietary approach of the future. Not only because it gave North Americans its solution for disease prevention, but because it laid the groundwork for the boom of low-fat, high-fiber consumer packaged goods like breakfast cereal. Now we can package the undigestible, fibrous hulls we were throwing away, put them in a box with a Prevents Heart Disease and Colon Cancer sticker, and make 10x the margins we were making before, while consumers feel like they're paying less and improving their health. In any case, I don't want to go off on a tangent here as we still have a lot to cover that's more specific to the vegan and vegetarian argument that meat is bad and less meat or no meat is healthier. The point is eating more fiber and less fat was built on fraudulent correlations and any hypothetical observations layered on top of this is no different. Not only because correlations don't equal causation, but because there's just as many correlations that suggest the opposite, which ultimately highlights that the hypothesis is probably incorrect and or that the study is biased. For instance, the reason the secluded tribes in Africa are healthier than those of us in the Western world likely has more to do with their lifestyle than their diet as evidenced by the tribes that eat the exact opposite of high fiber, low fat. But Burkitt and arguably Keyes were so zoned in on diet and so desperate for it to be diet, they ignored everything else and even ignored the evidence directly discrediting their hypothesis. As another example, and to quickly elaborate on the opposite correlations I mentioned, just take a look at the Mormons in the U.S. who actually ate a diet heavy in meat and fat and lower in fiber by public health guideline standards at less than 25 grams per day. Not only can one argue that they live a secluded or sheltered life in comparison to other U.S. citizens, similar to the tribesmen and women Burkitt studied in Africa, 
but they have far lower rates of cancer at 22% lower than the U.S. average overall and 37% lower for colon cancer. Highlighting the fact that Burkitt and Key's hypothesis are still incorrect, highlighting the fact that there's plenty of correlations discrediting any observational studies that preceded and cited their findings, and most importantly, highlighting that the argument against fat and fiber has no leg to stand on, especially when you hold it up against my part one video that highlights the pure and simple fact that most of us descended from human beings that ate more animal fat and less fiber, and none of us descended from human beings that ate no animal fat. All that said, let's keep moving forward with cholesterol to complete the trifecta of BS. And for this one, I'll direct you to a video illustration I created on this topic way back in 2014 for more information. Similar to my introductory book, I'll drop a link in the description for those that are interested and try to quickly summarize it here. Like the other two points, the first point is what I just reiterated from my part one video. We've always eaten dietary cholesterol. The majority of us have evolved from hunter-gatherers that ate lots of dietary cholesterol, and none of us have evolved from hunter-gatherers that ate no dietary cholesterol. But here's the kicker. Dietary cholesterol does not raise blood cholesterol. Or as biochemists put it in 1937, dietary cholesterol has very little effect on blood cholesterol, and this fact has never been refuted. Yet somehow the majority of the population is convinced that an egg white omelette is healthier for them than eating the yolk because cholesterol. Although the other kicker is that individuals eating less dietary cholesterol actually exhibit higher cholesterol levels. For instance, in 1982, the multiple risk factor intervention trial had over 350,000 men at high risk of heart disease reduce their consumption of dietary cholesterol and saturated fat by 42% and 28% respectively. Not only was there no improvement in heart disease risk, but blood cholesterol levels barely fell. Meaning you can try and eat as little cholesterol as you like, but it's not achieving your goal of lowering cholesterol levels. Instead, all you're doing is robbing your body of the 1200 to 1800 milligrams of new cholesterol it uses every day and the key benefits that come with it. To which you're probably thinking, but doesn't elevated cholesterol cause heart disease? And my answer is no. This is the biggest myth of them all, and arguably the one powering the anti-meat train the most. Like I said, I don't want to make a whole video about this, so please check out my animated video in the description for more detail. But quick backstory, in 1856, a German scientist theorized that blood cholesterol levels are associated with the development of heart disease. After supporting experiments on rabbits in 1913, the theory was dubbed the lipid hypothesis, and in 1984, the National Institute of Health gathered 14 experts who, after reviewing the so-called evidence, voted unanimously that lowering elevated blood cholesterol levels will reduce the risk of heart attacks caused by coronary heart disease. By 2002, the lipid hypothesis was no longer a theory, it was fact. But just like Key's low fat and Burkitt's high fiber, there's never been reliable proof that high cholesterol levels cause heart disease, and several MDs and scientists have stated that from the outset saying it's based on inaccuracies, misinterpretations, exaggerations, and misleading quotations in the research area. For instance, the original trials were done on rabbits, which are herbivores, that aren't able to properly process dietary cholesterol. And the experiments added chemically prepared bear cholesterol, which has a higher likelihood of being oxidized before consumption. But more importantly, all reliable large-scale studies since have found no association between cholesterol and heart disease, with this graph looking at total cholesterol and mortality from cardiovascular disease across 86 countries displaying that lack of association quite well, ultimately showing that half the people with heart disease have low cholesterol and half the people with high cholesterol have perfectly healthy hearts. So to recap, saturated fat is not associated with heart disease. 
dietary fiber is not associated with colon cancer, elevated cholesterol is not associated with heart disease. And any vegetarian or vegan claiming any of the above is unknowingly misinformed or purposely misinforming you. Since less fat, more fiber, and lower cholesterol are not benefits to a vegan and vegetarian diet or any diet for that matter. Unfortunately, it's not hard to misinform given the money relying on ensuring these three lies continue. Whether we're talking about the sale of low-fat, high-fiber monocrops themselves, the transition of these cheap fillers into prepackaged food and beverages, or the money being made on pharmaceutical intervention. And that's before you include the best-selling plant-based doctors and scientists and the funding they receive to do more observational research, documentaries, and talk shows to feed the fraud. Of those doctors and scientists, the one I want to touch on quickly today is Colin Campbell, the author of The China Study, since he's the one most referenced in documentaries and quickly cited by vegans and vegetarians anytime they're challenged on their views. Problem is, Campbell is no different or better than Keyes and Burkett when his research is actually analyzed, instead of being intimidated by his Bible of a book and the fact that he's a doctor or falling for the cognitive fluency bias most individuals, and especially current or aspiring vegans and vegetarians, have when reading it. Along with the research simply coming up with a hypothesis, not a fact, using observational data to suggest animal products increase cancer and heart disease, Campbell earns his title by straight up doctoring the results effectively applying adjusted correlations to animal foods while using unadjusted ones for plant foods and conveniently forgetting to mention all positive associations with higher intakes of meat and fat and lower cancer rates and lower intakes of meat and fat and higher cancer rates. For instance, the people of Tuoli consume 45% of their diet from fat and eat roughly 135 grams of animal protein and have lower heart disease and cancer, while the people of Longjin consume the lowest amount of animal foods, but have the second highest death rate from heart disease. And interestingly, Campbell's data also showed a seven times greater cancer association with a high carb, high sugar diet, fewer cancer deaths with a high animal fat intake, and a clear association between wheat and heart disease. But read his conclusion, and all of that is forgotten and conveniently left out, ultimately stating that people who ate the most animal-based foods got the most chronic disease. And operating with the same BS we covered earlier, stating pretty clearly on page 132 that eating foods that contain any cholesterol above 0 milligrams is unhealthy. But if all that wasn't bad enough, in 1998, scientists in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition used Campbell's exact data to evaluate his hypothesis and did not find a clear association between animal product consumption and risk of heart disease or major cancers. In fact, what the research actually shows is that the five regions with the best heart health ate more saturated fat, animal protein, and dietary cholesterol than the five worst. And these five regions also ate less plant protein, less vegetable oil, less wheat flour, and less fiber. But hey, layer this on top of the trifecta of BS, get endless research funded to pump the narrative, and have a couple documentaries cite Campbell's research, like Forks Over Knives, and you've got your proof. Though perhaps worst of all, align perfectly with big business and big government's agenda, and it becomes undeniable proof, and almost seen as harmful or malpractice to suggest otherwise. This is effectively where the anti-meat, anti-fat, pro-plant, pro-fiber narrative has gone, with annual review studies from big-name scientists and organizations coming to the same conclusions, the media hyping them up all over the place, and government agencies and public health panels delivering dietary guidelines to their citizens that support the findings. Even though I know, and you now know, 
that they are no better than the observations and hypothesis presented by Keyes, Burkett, and Campbell. But outside of the funding and lobbying and the problems we've already discussed, I want to highlight three additional considerations that most individuals are unaware of when it comes to nutrition studies and red meat research specifically. First of all, people that eat less red meat are generally more health conscious than those that do, whether that's not smoking, being more physically active, or avoiding sugar in processed foods. This is called the healthy user bias, and it's especially evident when the comparison is meat eating or no meat eating. Basically, the typical vegetarian is more likely to be someone that takes care of themselves, so they tend to avoid meat more than they consume it, because that's what we've been taught to believe is healthier, while their unhealthy counterparts tend to consume it more than they avoid it. And realistically, the meat eaters use could be any level of health consciousness, fast food eater included, since most people eat meat. The second problem with these studies is that food frequency questionnaires are a horrendous way to gather information. Many times getting people to recall exactly what they ate weeks prior, even though most of us can't remember what we ate for breakfast yesterday. And having greater than 50% of participants straight up lie about what they're eating. So even if there is a correlation, it's more like an increased risk in relation to someone's likelihood of reporting eating meat. And yes, I recognize that this is the case for the majority of observational studies in the nutrition field, but that doesn't make the correlation any stronger. It simply highlights the fact that the correlation isn't strong, and thus hardly proves an association that warrants a hypothesis, let alone proving causation and supplying evidence that humans should all of a sudden eat less meat or no meat, despite our evolutionary history of hunting and omnivorous eating habits. Last but not least, point number three is that the meat-eating versus vegetarian observational studies don't make a clear distinction between meat quality, with the researchers grouping steaks together with fast food hamburgers, hot dogs, and pizza toppings, because it's all red meat, right? You and I both know this isn't the case, and allowing this type of skewing to exist simply exacerbates the healthy user bias we've already discussed. Compare fast food e eaters to health conscious vegetarians, and how do you not get a correlation? And more importantly, how do you ignore everything else that comes with fast food and zone in on the meat? No chances to soft drinks and vegetable oil deep frying, I guess? The funny part being, even though all these biases exist, the researchers often have trouble showing an association with vegetarian diets and better health outcomes or worse, find the opposite to be true, despite using an unhealthy bunch of meat eaters. For instance, the Epic Oxford study from 2009 in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition found a higher incidence of colorectal cancer in vegetarians than meat eaters. But that's not the point, right? The point is that these studies are meaningless because of all the errors I mentioned above. And the plain and simple fact that there are observations that are supposed to form hypotheses for further study, not for conclusions, especially when they're quickly debunked when placed in front of an evolution and dietary needs backdrop. The facts are any association between meat, red meat, processed meat, and colorectal cancer and heart disease are no stronger than any of the hundreds of studies on other foods and cancer. And this is true whether they're a review of observational studies or not. Crappy studies with crappy data coming to meaningless correlations don't all of a sudden get less crappy and meaningless when you group them all together. Nothing's been proven. The conclusion is an unreliable hypothesis, and no one should base their behavior off the results, especially when that behavior change would mean going against the dietary habits that made you evolve as a human being. And that, once again, is the takeaway. Yes, I've highlighted the flaws in the narrative on saturated fat, cholesterol, and fiber, and shown you exactly what's wrong with Colin Campbell's cancer research and the ongoing push to make something out of nothing when it comes to observational studies on meat, red meat, and processed meat. But the ultimate eye-opener should be the information I presented in video one, because these meaningless studies and the corrupt scientists and doctors that try to suggest they mean something 
are simply a distraction from the reality that human beings are supposed to eat meat. I won't say much outside of that, because this video is far too long already. But that's where the meaningful health consequences arrive for those believing vegan or vegetarian living is superior. The brain and body need the essential nutrients I cover in that video. And those attempting to acquire those nutrients elsewhere are putting their health at risk. Whether that's from the deficiencies themselves or the chronic inflammation and imbalances that occur as a result. For instance, the five biggest concerns for people with respect to their health in the 21st century tend to center on heart disease, diabetes, dementia, cancer, and physical degeneration. And there's clear evidence that the key biomarkers for all of these outcomes are elevated when individuals restrict animal protein, saturated fat, and cholesterol, and attempt to acquire their nutrients and amino acids from excessive amounts of high-fiber, low-fat, plant-based alternatives, even if we assume it's a near-perfect vegan or vegetarian diet, which you and I both know isn't the case. With inadequate animal fat and protein effectively leading to the deficiencies you see on the left of your screen, and excessive plant-based proteins and fats leading to the issues and imbalances seen on the right. And both sides collectively increasing one's risk of heart disease, diabetes, dementia, cancer, and physical degeneration because of their impact on inflammation, oxidation, and metabolic dysfunction, which actually cause disease. But for more on that, I encourage you to check out part one of this video and my introductory book, Eat Meat and Stop Jogging, which is now free on my personal blog and at eatmeatandstopjogging.com. It covers many of the topics we went over here in greater detail, as well as a few others that are more than likely preventing you from reaching your health and fitness goals. Thanks for watching.